It's right there uh, by the drawing room. Yeah, it's right next door to it. All righty, so let's go over this. I'm sorry that it was sideways. Sitting sideways, right? <laughs> but uh, I'll just read off my iPad here since it's easier. Uh, with the iPad, if this ever happens, I guess you could just lock the screen and turn it. That's fine. Um, I just want to go over this this reading questions with you. If you didn't do it, which some of you didn't, I advise you to turn it in as we're going over it. You're not going to receive full credit, but you'll receive partial credit. Something's better than nothing, I guess, right? So if you didn't do it, please, please, please fill this out now as we go over it. One, this article is mainly about the blank system in Nazi Germany. What do we have? What do we got here? Melissa, what do you have? Oh, my, I'm sorry. My bad. Bad. Yeah, the educational system, right? So we talked yesterday about the Hitler Youth Organization, how Hitler was trying to target these, uh, you know, the, the children, the younger generation, to make sure that his ideas, his theories, his beliefs, his Nazi ideology will continue on after he's he's long gone, right? All right, so the best way to do that is target the educational systems. Try to maybe brainwash some of these children, the youth, the younger generation. And uh, we know at the Hitler Youth Organization how they target many of these kids and train them to be war machines in a way, which we'll talk more about with the bell ring. Two, the Nazis' blank education. Autumn, what do you have? For number two? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. A, hey, yeah, restricted. Yep, good job, restricted. Good. All right. So, yeah, they didn't outlaw it. OK, they thought it was very essential for children to learn about their beliefs. And we talked about race science yesterday, how they targeted and stereotyped many of these, uh, you know, these children or these different races and ethnicities all throughout the world and um, tried to prove their Aryan race, their Aryan culture. OK. And their teachings. We know with different, you know, with measurements of noses and you know, obviously they, they detailed on skin color, they detailed it on posture, you name it. Uh, what they wore, materialistic lifestyle. Three, students were taught that Germany's loss in World War I was in a large part the fault of the, we got Chris. Yeah, right, the Jews, right? And we talked about communists as well. Okay, these other different types of political viewpoints that aren't, in line with the you know, extreme nationalism, the Nazi party. Okay. Good. Five, teachers were allowed to teach what? Haley Klinger, what do you got for five? Yeah, B, Nazi beliefs. Okay. So other political viewpoints, other things that might challenge or compete against the Nazi belief that would have uh, be illegal. And we know, we talked about yesterday how the Nazi party tried to screen many of the teachers, the administrators into public schools, private schools, all throughout Germany to make sure that they are following their guidelines, their regulations of what should be taught in schools with, like I mentioned, race, race science and beliefs of the Nazi party and theories of that. Six, oh, uh, Albert Einstein. Why did Albert Einstein leave Germany? What do we have for this one? What do you got here? Jakari, what do you got for six? Uh, he's a pacifist. Yeah, what does that mean? Like, yeah, good job. So he didn't agree with warfare. Um, obviously, with the Hitler Youth Organization, they're training these children to be war machines, right? They're training them to be soldiers, to uh, be combative with weapons and living out in the environments on their own. And, and, uh, and Einstein didn't believe in warfare and brutality. So what happened to him, Jakari? Or what did uh, the Nazis do with him? Do you need help here? Haley, go ahead. They took away his job. Yeah, they took away his job, right? So he was a professor, okay? He was teaching a lot of uh, different sciences, okay? And uh, they took away his property, right? And they uh, pretty much kind of forced him out of Germany. And where did he go? Go ahead. Yeah, America. Okay, America. 
and he will help out with the Manhattan Project, which we'll talk more about towards the end of World War II, which was the creation of the atomic bomb. All right, seven, who are the White Rose Group? Okay, Autumn, we talked about this in conflicts. Who's the White Rose Group? Who was it? Who was it? Alyssa, what do you have for this one here, seven? Yeah, good job. So they're like resistance groups. Okay, there are people that try to, and, and individuals, usually uh, they were a part of you know, colleges, universities, younger generation, and they oppose the Nazi rhetoric. They oppose the Nazi um, uh, methods and beliefs, and they try to combat against it. All right? They uh, handed out leaflets, okay, which are pretty much like letters to people and say, hey, you know, this is how they're controlling your life. The government shouldn't be this involved in your life. Okay, these are the, some of the atrocities that they're performing with anti-Semitism and, and uh, you know, disbanding some of these ethnic groups and cultures in Germany. And you need to fight up. You know, you need to fight and rise up against it. And uh, they did this with posters. Okay, they kind of did this in secrecy. Why do they think they try to do it in secrecy? Why do you think? Haley, why do you think? Yeah. Yeah, they'd be kicked out of their schools or universities. They'd be killed, okay? So just simple as maybe just walking down the hall, making sure no one's looking and putting up a poster. You know, just, hey, join the join the movement. Join the fight against uh, this oppressive government, the Nazi party, okay? Uh, handing out, like, letters, like I mentioned. And, uh, you know, writing articles in school newspapers. This wasn't allowed in Nazi Germany, so if they, were ever, if they ever saw anything like this, they would try to find the source, find these people. And uh, many of the members of the White Rose were actually killed, okay, by a, by a, a shooting range, like a shooting line. Okay, they just kind of lined them up and took them all down. So it's unfortunate. But uh, that group, again, was very resilient in their fighting against that Nazi party. Eight, we can tell that the Nazis knew that education was powerful because what do we have for this one? Zerbi, what do you have? Yeah, all the above. So they fired teachers who disagreed with them. They did not allow did not allow Jews to be educated. They changed the curriculum in German schools. You name it, all of them. All right, nine. What do you think a typical day would have been like for a student in Nazi Germany? All right, so this is obviously opinionated here. So what do we have here? What do we have? Autumn, what do you have for nine? You can't read it. Well, what do you think, though? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much just talking about how, uh, you know, the, the, the German the German ideology, this Aryan race, okay, and uh, really disbanding and disowning many of these other, the, right, the loit, the un, undesirable subhuman people, and the, those constant uh, beat up of that and glorification of Germany. Uh, viewing Hitler as this god, like we mentioned and talked about, what the Hitler Youth was trying to you know, try to establish, um, many different forms of sciences as well, because we all know with their technology, their weaponry, they're very advanced in their military. So uh, many things like that. Ten in Nazi Germany, the rights of students and teachers were severely limited. Today, both students and teachers have more rights. Uh, but there are still limits on those rights. What limits do you think there should be on rights of teachers and students today? Haley, I liked yours. What did you say? Yeah, Claire, sorry. Yeah, good job. So talking politics especially, right? If you're trying to, it's good to teach the history about politics, okay, maybe how to get involved. But uh, if it's to the point where you're trying to almost push a person or push a student towards one political belief, then that's not right. Okay, that's not acceptable. Uh, children should have, and obviously uh, adults as well, should have the ability to make their own decisions and opinions about politics. Yeah, in that class last year, oh my gosh, it seemed like every other day they were taking pictures of me or Hoover. I know Brendan McAllister used to do it all the time, and uh, it's pretty crazy, pretty crazy. Pretty funny thing. And whenever you're not looking, they're taking a picture of you. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right. Is there any questions on that? You guys good? 
All right, so you can see why education was a priority for Nazi Germany. Right, again, target the youth, brainwash them, almost make these uh, molded individuals to carry on the Nazi ideology and beliefs. Okay. All right, is there any questions? Okay, moving on. Bell ringer for today. So piggybacking off of that and just review of what we went over yesterday. Try to help us out, of course, with what we're going to talk about. So describe what the Hitler youth was. Why would Hitler want to target the youth in Germany? Okay, I kind of just went over that. But write that down so you can obviously use it as a study tool, then, if we ever have a quiz or a test. Everybody see it all right? Should I zoom in more? Good? Okay. Just a reminder, Alyssa, you have your current event for Friday. Okay. All right, I'll give you another minute to finish up here, and we'll move on. All right, so describe what the Hitler Youth was. Why would Hitler want to target the youth in Germany? Chris, what do you have, buddy? Um, 
part of the future journey so that the new generation will learn the living as well as all the generations. Yeah, good work. Good work. So this organization targeting the youth, targeting the children, the younger generation to make sure that they are abiding by the Nazi regulations and guidelines they have set out. And if you target them at a young age, that's really the only principles that they know. That's really the only understanding and concepts that they understand and know. Right. And uh, this is really just to continue on his beliefs, his theories on really everything. OK, so with military, military strategy anti-Semitic beliefs and thoughts, which we talked about, discussed already a little bit, okay, with the race science. And uh, if he continues this, and uh, that's really, like I mentioned, the only things that these the, these children know. And uh, not only in education, where he controlled it, but, you know, obviously with different types of groups, uh, almost like the Boy Scouts in a way. I'm not comparing the Boy Scouts to Hillary, so I'm not doing that, but I'm just saying, you know, with uh, going out and pitching tents, living out in the environments on their own, um, uh, using weapons and how to use them, and uh, you know, just kind of combating against the elements if they had to out in the, out in the wilderness if they were fighting. Okay, planning and practicing military strategies and doing different types of military games. Okay, and uh, that was a way to prepare them for war, for battle. Okay, so in a way, they're preparing them to be merciless soldiers. And in some cases, they would have like bunnies, like little rabbits. Okay, obviously, we know as them's cute, cuddly, all oh, cute things. Maybe you can say like a kitten. And they would have them kill them, right? To try to not have an emotional connection to these things and to these animals, right? So when they're out on the battlefield, they won't feel bad or feel concern or an emotional tie to something before they take it out, right? Take it out. Fortunately, that's kind of what happened to these, these children. And they're given rewards uh, for their, for their, for their tactics, right? And their, their things that they've accomplished in this youth organization, whether it's badges or maybe a higher ranking or something like that. All right, and like I mentioned too, whenever there was a greeting, when they wouldn't just say, hey, hey, how you doing? They'd walk around and say, hi, Hitler, and, and uh, continue their allegiance to, to Hitler. Did anybody watch Jojo Rabbit then yesterday? No? Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, that, that movie, again, a lot of these children viewed Hitler as almost like this imaginary friend, um, uh, expressing and, and, and believing that he is always looking over their shoulders. They viewed him as a god. And that's what they were believed to and learned to believe for so long. A lot of it had to do with kind of the prosperity and the wealth that he brought Germany at, uh, you know, through that depression at the end of World War One. Okay. Is there any questions on the Hitler Youth? We good? All right. I think we're good with that. We can move on. All right. So today, two terms. That's it. We're going to talk about. Crystal Knot, and we won't talk too much about concentration camps, but uh, this is kind of the beginnings of it. Oh, let me unfreeze it. There you go. All right, so Crystal Knot, we're going to really talk and discuss over today. This is really following the establishment of the Hitler Youth, okay, the Nuremberg Laws, and uh, this is getting closer and closer to what we know as the Holocaust. Okay, these concentration camps we'll mention a little bit today towards the end of the chapter, not too much. And then ultimately we know with the death camps. Let's give some time, look these up right now, and we'll move on.
All right. So what do we have? Concentration camp. What is that? Lance, what do you got, buddy? A place where large numbers of people, especially those with international numbers, are pushed through the holidays, and will be deliberately imprisoned in a relatively small area with inadequate facilities and forced to do so. Yeah, good work, good work. So uh, not only in Germany did this happen, we all know with the USSR, okay, uh, Stalin was kind of doing the same thing with the gulags. Uh, Mussolini was probably doing the same thing as well, okay. But with Hitler, we know with the minority groups, okay, Jewish people, communists, anybody that had a different opinion than his were forced to these labor camps, okay. And uh, we know with these labor camps, they weren't very uh, – pleasant at all okay they didn't have the living conditions uh, they were very poor they didn't have adequate food if food at all um they were forced to wear these different types of uniforms and uh their their heads were shaved right when they got to the camps to try to dehumanize them they're known for just numbers or brands on their arms okay like a tattoo in a way and this was really just trying to express that Aryan idea, okay? And these people were pushed to these concentration camps because they weren't viewed as the same or equal as the Volk, right? The higher class people, as what Hitler would, would mention and describe them as. Okay, so the Loit would go to this concentration camp. Anybody that would oppose Hitler would go to this concentration camp. And uh, they would really just whether it's building different types of forms of transportation, whether it's just creating more wartime supplies and materials for the army, uh, you name it. And, kind of, and it was kind of endless what these labor camps were all about, mining different types of elements. Eventually, that will lead to death camps, where many of these people of minority groups and the Loit, as what uh, Hitler would describe them as, would just be killed by the hundreds of thousands even millions. All right, what do you have for Crystal Knot? Angel? All right, good job. So if you want to put in parentheses, night of broken glass, right? So the night of broken glass. And this was described as really the first comings of the Holocaust. All right? We know with the Nuremberg Laws, that was another step to it. But Kristallnacht kind of slowly followed, right, 1938, where many of these individuals were gathered up, okay, of minority groups, Jewish people, uh, communists, well, you name it, right, people that had, had different political views, mostly Jewish people, and uh, their, their places of worship, synagogues, which are like churches, were burned to the ground. Over 200 of them were. Uh, almost 100 people killed in these acts. Uh, carried out by the SA, which we'll talk about, which is like their secret police of Germany. Uh, the Gestapo, the Hitler Youth as well. And destroying restaurants, businesses, and forcing many of these people, uh, by Jewish, to, Jewish descent, to push out of Germany and force them out. Okay, Burning of different types of writings and books. All right, we'll talk about that more in detail here soon. All right, so there you go. Nine of broken glass. That's what you can put in parentheses right beside it. All right, so Crystal Knock, a little bit more in detail here. There you go. All right, so November 9th, 1938. So before we get here, okay, we talked about the Hitler Youth Organization. We talked about how this group was established to try to continue Hitler's beliefs and theories once he's gone. Uh, we talked a little bit about the 1936 Olympics, right? And this was a way for Hitler to express to the rest of the world the prosperity and uh, the wealth that Germany had. So the buildings of these massive stadiums and beautiful architectural buildings. And uh, we know with different forms of flags hanging from all over around the cities. Okay, especially Berlin in 1936. And this was a way to show the rest of the world where Germany was standing in 1936. Okay, we know what was America going through in 1936. What were they going through? Just learned about it last chapter. Chris? Yeah, the Great Depression. Okay, this was all around the world. 
I guess you could say Italy kind of going through some prosperous times with Germany and the Soviet Union. But Germany was at the highest peak, okay? And everybody that came to the Olympic Games were just amazed by um, how quick of a turnaround this was. We know with the Treaty of Versailles, the depression that went hold in Germany, uh, we, we kind of know that this was terrible times. And just like that, a snap of the finger under Hitler's supreme leadership, uh, he, he took Germany into this depression you know, living to a higher standard of living, prosperity and wealth. People going to restaurants, uh, going to entertainment centers and enjoying, I guess you could say, somewhat of life. And we'll talk about some of the problems and issues and terrible things that Hitler did today with Crystal Knoll. All right, so 1938 is a step closer towards, you know, the Holocaust. We know what the Nuremberg Laws, what were the Nuremberg Laws again? What did they do? What were they, Jakari? Uh, they took Jewish people's rights. Yeah, right? So they're taking their citizenship away from them. So we all know with his leadership, uh, Hitler's, he was the supreme leader. There was, there was no competition or opposing party. All right, that was kind of casted out. So taking their citizenship, they didn't have the ability to run for politics or maybe have a, a, a say in government. Um, also, they, didn't, they, didn't, they were kind of pushed to the side with businesses. Any type of workplace they had, there was taken away from them. Uh, they weren't allowed to marry German citizens. Okay, these Jewish people, these minority groups, because that's not going to help the lineage of the Aryan race is what he described it. All right. So the Nuremberg Laws was kind of that first establishment of that Holocaust. Right. People had to walk around with Star Davids that were of Jewish descent. And uh, this was to label them out in the streets. And, uh, you know, the Nazi propaganda and media pointed out, hey, if you see these people walk in the streets with that Star David, you know, maybe throw them around, push them to the curb. Uh, throw some bricks at them, okay, you name it, to try to push them out of the country. If you see them having a business or a store, all right, don't go there. Right? Don't give them any type of business. All right? And in many cases, loot it. All right? The authorities won't stop you in doing that. It's kind of what they described in these Nuremberg laws. But uh, the Night of Broken Glass was kind of that first taste of what's to come with these concentration camps and the death camps okay so people german citizens uh, we know what hitler gave these people he gave them homes right prosperous times he gave them jobs uh, they had the ability to afford food and put it on the table they had the ability to earn a car and a living right and they're like well we can see the Gestapo walking around, the military walking around the streets, and we're very afraid if we ever try to challenge Hitler here, right? If we ever try to help these people out of Jewish descent and uh, we're seen by the Gestapo or secret police, we'll probably be forced in jail or lose our jobs or even killed, right? So these people, these German citizens, um, kind of just followed suit, just, uh, just really formed to what Hitler perpetrated and, and Hitler... Hitler established in Germany. Okay. So that means whenever they saw someone walking down the street with a star, David, they would harass them. Okay. They would uh, throw things at these people. They would try to force them out of their town, of their city, and uh, really expressing that they don't belong there. So at one time, these people were neighbors or friends. Okay. Maybe in some cases, sometimes family to these people. And all of a sudden, you have neighbors, family members, friends turning on each other because of different ethnicity, different culture. It's a sad, sad thing to see, uh, but uh, that's what happened in Germany. It's to a point just because they had a different culture, maybe a different skin color, maybe a different ethnicity, that uh, these people were forced to live these terrible lives. And it was pushed upon by their once friends or their once family members. Uh, citizens, neighbors in their, in their towns and cities in Germany. All right, but with the Night of Broken Glass, this is, again, moving closer and closer to the start of World War II. All right, so Hitler decided, you know what, the Hitler Youth Organization, uh, the uh, Gestapo, the SA, which is like the secret police for Germany, for Nazi Germany. Uh, if you ever see a synagogue, which is a you know, place of worship, for the Jewish people, like a church. 
uh, burn it down, destroy it. Okay, this was the night where this was no holds bar. Uh, he told the Hitler youth to destroy any restaurants, any businesses that you know of, of these Jewish people. This is kind of like the first statement of gathering these groups of people up and sending and deporting them out of these cities and towns. So throwing bricks through windows, uh, you know, really destroying these businesses, looting them, taking their money, taking their, uh, taking their belongings. And the authorities were actually part of the people doing it in Germany. Again, this was trying to push them out of society. In a way, for the Hitler youth, for these German citizens that were forced to believe Hitler's policies and beliefs, okay, uh, this was almost like a huge party, like a huge, I guess you could say, um, parade where they were marching down streets, expressing their, their glorification of Nazi Germany and destroying as much as they could of people of different descent, especially Jewish descent, Jewish culture. Okay. Like I mentioned, they were just kind of throwing bricks through windows and looting them and taking whatever they had. I uh, pushed to different schools. Like if there is a person that ha a Jewish person that had books or written material or articles, they threw it out in the streets and burned it. They're trying to rid it from German culture. Okay, because they're viewed as the Lloyd. All right, so with the aftermath, we have 200 synagogues and 7,500 Jewish businesses destroyed. That's a lot. Okay, that's a lot. You can imagine if you own a pizza shop or if you own a restaurant or a business. And uh, you're dependent on, obviously, people buying your products and goods. And for many years, you're a respected person in that town, in that city. Um, and all of a sudden, Hitler comes in charge, and he believes and pushes these people to uh, you know, build a hatred. Friends and families are as well. So they're destroying and looting these businesses and trying to force these people out. Oh, sorry, I got cut off a little bit. 200 Jews killed, 600 injured, and thousands arrested. So this is, like I mentioned before, the beginnings of gathering these people up and uh, deporting them to these concentration camps, to these labor camps. Was there anybody to stop Germany from doing this, Hitler to doing this? No. Right? We, don't, we know that's not. Uh, the League of Nations was too weak. France and Great Britain knew that they couldn't compete with this military power that Germany had. And they're just like, well, just kinda, what's up? How many injured? Oh, 600. Sorry. And thousands arrested. So in a way, Kristallnacht was Hitler's belief and thought of purifying Germany. So if you want to just write that down, uh, that, that would be good. So this was his belief of purifying Germany. Okay, making it suitable for the Aryan culture, the Aryan race. Um, getting rid of the Loy, pushing them out. I guess you could say this was their ability to say, hey, if you don't, this is your chance now. If you don't move out of the, if the boundaries of Germany after the Nuremberg Laws, after Kristallnacht, then concentration camps, death camps are going to be about to happen. And we all know that with the Holocaust. All right, is there any questions on that? You guys good with the Night of Broken Glass, Crystal Knot? Okay. All right, I just have a video for you. That's it. I had a reading, but you know what? I think I tortured you enough with those, right? What do you think? Yeah? Okay. Ethan, are you happy with no reading today? Okay, good.